Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians, the second chapter. And we're going to start at verse 1. Ephesians 2, 1. Ephesians 2, 1, it says this, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were, say were, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Does that sound, does verses 1, 2, and 3 sound real great? Does that sound like something you want to put on a resume? That you were once of the sons of disobedience, and you conducted yourself that way? But verse 4 says what? But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Say amen. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, probably the pinnacle, one of the pinnacle scriptures of our faith. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the what? It is the gift of God. And not of works, lest anyone should boast. Then verse 10, we're going to land right here. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So say, I'm his workmanship. All right, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for today. Father, we thank you for your presence that's in this place. We thank you, Father, for your love that reached down and lifted us. So, Lord, we thank you that you, Jesus, were victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And you took the keys of that and you made a spectacle of it openly for us. So, Father, we thank you for your power working in and through us. And Lord, we just praise you. We thank you. Lord, we thank you today that we will see Jesus more clearly today than what we saw of him yesterday. So Father, we just thank you for every good thing comes from you. And Lord, we thank you for the St. Louis Cardinals. Father, we thank you that Albert's back that he will hit 25 home runs, that they will retire on top with the trophy in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. It's important we pray. We have a winning streak. That's a good thing. (coughs) Have you ever heard stuff growing up and through life you just hear things and people tell you all the time things like, hey, you know, everything's going to be okay, and and everything's going to be great, or hey, you're doing good, and you just wonder, like, do they really mean that? Do they really, do they really mean that, or do we just say things to say things sometimes? Have you ever wondered that sometimes in life? And so, you know, sometimes when we read scripture, sometimes when we look at scripture, especially like famous passages like Ephesians 2.10, We hear you are his workmanship created in Christ. I mean, I've heard this my whole life, you know, with this, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But if you really just 
just say it, but you don't slow down enough sometimes and really look at what that scripture is saying to you. Amen? It's saying it to you. It says it to you. We quote this all the time, for we are his workmanship. One translation we'll get into a little later says masterpiece, for we are his masterpiece. And we, we quote that, we love that, it's all true. But the more I've been studying this, the more I've been looking at it, sometimes words just kind of pop off the page to me. And the biggest thing that I have missed at times is the, is the fourth word in. For we are his. For I am his masterpiece. I am his workmanship. I am his song. I am his. I'm his. I'm his. I'm nobody else's. I'm his. And, you know, for us to really know who we are in Christ, you have to know whose you are first. To know who you are, you first have to know whose you are. And when you know who you are and whose you are, you then learn whose you're not. You also learn who you're not. You're not an old sinner saved by grace. You're not an old sinner. No, you were dead. You were dead spiritually on the inside. You were dead. You were like the walking dead. You know, I've never watched the show. I've actually been bit by a person before, so watching that show kind of always scared me a little bit, but I'll tell you that for another day. But, you know, if you're, I mean, it's a dumb show. You watch it and people are walking around like this, da 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 But how many of us have felt like in growing up in church, you've seen some walking dead? They're there, but they're not there. They're physically here, but on the inside, they're not, there's something not clicking. Or have you ever felt that way? Like physically, you're present, but emotionally, mentally, spiritually, you're just not really connected. Have you ever felt that way? Because back to, Ephesians, back to verse 1, it says, You he made alive. You he made alive. He didn't make you sad. He didn't make you depressed. He didn't come to put a bunch of rules and regulations on you. He didn't come to make you, to make you like form in a line and do everything just right and say everything just right. No, he made you alive. He made you alive. Smack your neighbor and say, I'm alive. Rachel, I love you. She just reached over and smacked her daughter real hard. You're alive. You're alive. We are alive. We are well in him. We're stable in him. Why? Because you're his. You are his. You are his. You belong to God. Think about that. Everybody say this. Say, I belong to God. Say it again. I belong to God. You know, Hannah talked about having a kid. You know, my kid belongs to me. Don't try to get near her and don't try because we'll come out because she belongs to me. And I try to know at all times where she's at because she belongs to me. She's precious to me. She belongs to us. That's how Hannah took half my message because that's how God feels about you. When Madison was born, she was sticky and slimy and screaming and mad and loud and wouldn't be quiet. But the minute I held her, I fell in love with her. And my first thought was, and I looked at her and said, I'm going to buy you a pony. I just loved her so much. It's like whatever you want, whatever you need. We're, she, did nothing, she did nothing for me to earn, to earn my love. You were made, but, but the minute I looked at her, I saw her mom, and I saw my family, and I saw that, and I just loved her, and I knew that she came from us. She's in the image of us. You, everyone in this room, are made in the very image of God. 
handcrafted, hand-formed in the image of God to where when he looks at you, he goes, PJ's mine. He's mine. He's mine. Because when you know whose you are, then you really know who you are. You really know who we are. Amen? Because when you know who you are, then you know what you're not. Because verse 2 and 3, it talks about, you know, you followed after Satan. And you followed after him. You once walked in the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. But what's the key word right there? You all once conducted yourselves. Right there. Among whom you all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and you what were? What's the, what's the key word right there? You were. You're not. No, you were. You were that, but you're not that anymore. Thank you, Miss Mary. You were. You were a trespasser. Which simply just means you got off the path. And you were. We were all that. And we were dead. But what does verse 4 says? Verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy. I didn't learn. I mean, I am from Crawford County. And so I don't know... I don't know much English. I speak American, not English. But what I do know is that but right there, that's a big but. That's a big but. Because that word, that but God right there, cancels out everything that was previously said. So you were a trespasser, and you got off the path, and you were following after the sons of disobedience, and you were going after the lust of your flesh, and you were doing all that. But God. Everybody say, but God. But God, who is rich. What does rich mean? Not broke. He is not broke. He is rich in mercy. He is rich in forgiveness. He is rich in love. He is rich in peace. He is rich in all the good things of life. He is rich in them. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. He didn't love you out of pity. God didn't feel bad for you, and that's why he sent Jesus. He didn't love you out of duty, because, you know, we always say, well, I have to love them. God tells me I have to love them, and God has to love everybody. No, God doesn't love you out of duty. He doesn't love you out of duty. He doesn't love you out of obligation, like he just, you know, you know, like, well, here comes Kenny. We'll just love him today. He doesn't love you out of obligation. No, he loves you out of his love for you. His love is what generates the love for you. He's obsessed with you. He's mad about you. He loves you so much. He loved you so much, he died for you. You are to die for. You are to die for. And so, because of his great love, in which he loved us. Amen? Amen. He loves you. Say, he loves me. He loves me. And then we can just, do, let's do five and six. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. You know what that word made alive means? Marked vital. You know, 2020 hit, half the people got quarantined, and we all got to stay home, and then there was other people who got keyed as what? Essential. Essential. And it was like, best of luck to you, go have fun. Because you got marked essential. You are marked essential to God. 
You are vital to God. You are vital to his plan. You are important to him. Don't ever let anything in this world or anyone in this world try to diminish the value that you have to God. You have value to him. You are vital to him. You're important to him. That's why he died for you. That's why he sent his son. The highest payment he had. He was all in for you. Because you're important. You're special. You're important to God. Amen? Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. You were dead, and he took you. He took you. He took you. My dad, growing up, we, he loved going. We, we'd always go to junkyards. The one thing about junkyards is there's a lot of death. You see a lot of death in a junkyard. Rust. Dents, holes in things, blowed up motors, everything. But my dad always saw treasures. He always saw something that could be used, something of value, something of worth. When you were dead, Jesus saw value and worth in you. In you. And he looked at you and he said, you're vital. You're vital. With all your flaws, with all the things going on in your life, and every little thing that might be there, he looked at you and he said, they're vital to me. Amen? Verse 6, please. And he raised us up together. He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. That word raise means he helped, he elevated you to a higher level. He elevated you. He promoted you to a higher level. He raised you up together with him to sit with him. That word sit right there just refers to rest. To rest with him. To be at peace with him. To be at ease with him. We don't have to be running around trying to be like, I got to do something for God. I got to do something for God. I got to do something right now. I got to do something right now. No, he raised us up together. And he made us sit together with him in heavenly places. Amen? You've been elevated to a higher level, to a higher place. To a higher place. Think about that. We're not just, we're not just getting by. You know, sometimes, what, 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 what sorry, I'll slow down. Must be there. There's a remnant of Dan up here. So I'll slow down here a minute. What happens in life is things in life happen, and what the things in life do is they try to bring us down and not make us feel like we're just down with everything in the problem. Salvation, peace, joy isn't an absent of problems in your life. It's just not letting those problems have you. Peace isn't the absence of it. It's just not allowing it to have me. I have a peace that I'm elevated. I am higher. That's beneath me. That's beneath me. You know, it says that he put all things under our feet. It's beneath me. Amen? But then verse 7. Verse 7 says that in the ages to come, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us. Let's put that in the new living if we could, Brandon. That in the ages to come. So the new living says this, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of, of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us and show in us all he has done for us who are united with Christ. Thank you, Mom. And show, so look at here, that he, that God can point to us, that God can point to us. You know, if you go to Bush Stadium, you walk into Bush Stadium, you look right there in center field. 
there's the American flag. Then right below the American flag are 11 flags from 1926 to 2011. And what do those flags all represent, Dave? Championships. And so whenever you bring somebody who is not a Cardinal fan, the first thing you do is you point to those. You point to those. You point to them. Then you point to the outfield wall where all of like the 14 Hall of Famers are all listed and they're all represented. Then you point to that. Why do you do that? Because you point to that to show we've been victorious. We have won. You know, I watched opening day. I watch opening day every year. Watched it on TV this year. And they always bring out the trophies. They present the trophies. And the trophies are on a pedestal. And they're shining. And they're great examples. Why? Because nobody else in the National League has that many trophies. So we display that for all to see. And we point to that. You. Me. Me. We are God's trophy. We are God's trophy of his grace, of his favor, of his forgiveness, of his love. We are his trophy. Come on now. You are his trophy. You're not just a piece of junk that he throws. Like, if you look, if you look back here, there's all kinds of stuff back here. Some of it's value and some of it's just kind of... Like we got a can of spinach, we got crown of thorns, we got a lighter, and it's all just put back here so nobody can see it. We know where it's at, but nobody can see it. It's like the junk drawer. God didn't put you in the junk drawer. He didn't put you in a junk drawer. You're not in the junk drawer. You're not just piled up with a bunch of useless stuff that nobody cares about, that nobody wants, that nobody remembers, and that you forget that you actually had it, so you go buy another one. God doesn't put you there. He put you in a place of honor. He put you in a place so that for the ages to come, that beyond you on this earth, he can point to you, and he can say, I was victorious. I won the day. It They all said it couldn't be done, but I won. They all said that their life was over, but I won them. My friend Royce is here. He's my barber. I love Royce. But there was at a time, probably about five years ago, where there was no championship for Royce's life. And it was bottom of the ninth, and there was two outs, and it didn't look good. But God, who is rich in mercy... Out of his great love, he loved Royce. So that in the ages to come, he can point to Royce. Now Royce has a beautiful fiance. They're getting married. We're going to do the wedding on the beach. It's going to be fun. So that in the ages to come, God can point. That can say that the, the world thought it was over, but I won the day. I won the day. You are his trophy. That word show there actually means, in the Greek, it literally means to show off. God wants to show off you, to show off his victory that he did for you. We already quoted it, but thanks be unto God who gives us the victory. He won it, not you. He won it. So he displays his grace, and he shows off his grace, and he shows that all off by justifying you. By supplying you, by strengthening you. You know, Paul said, when I am weak, he is strong within me. Paul wrote, his grace is all I need. For I am sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. But he also, he justified you, just as if it didn't happen. Supplies you with wisdom, guidance favor, health, strengthens you when you feel like you're weak, when you feel like you're a dish towel. He strengthens you. But he also, his grace saved us. It saved us. Verse 8 says, For by grace we have been saved through faith. The 
flip back in the New King James. But for by grace you've been saved. That word grace, you know, we say it a lot. We love it. Simply means unmerited, unearned favor. Favor. Anybody like favor? Anybody like favor? I don't know. I mean, some of you are sitting there like, oh, favor's okay. No, I like favor. I like favor. I had an aunt. I say this all the time, but I had an aunt. Because when you have favor with somebody, you know that you're their favorite. And I had an aunt, and I was her favorite. Everybody knew it, and if they didn't know it, I would tell you that I am her favorite. I could do anything I wanted to do at her house. I could do anything I wanted to do. She actually had she actually had all these toy guns that I would play with as a kid. Nobody else was allowed to touch them. She had a special box put away just for me. So when I came over, I had my own things. Cuz I had favor with her. You have favor with God. And not just like get out of a speeding ticket favor. You have unmerited, which means total access, favor with God. You have complete and total access to God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by whom we have access into this grace, into this favor in which we now stand. You stand in favor. You sit in favor. You are God's favorite. We used to have an old preacher used to come here, and he used to say, you are the best God's got. You're the best he's got. You're not, you're not just all he's got. No, you're the best. You're the top shelf. You're the top mark. You're his favorite. So for by his favor, you've been saved, rescued, delivered, redeemed, Set apart. What does it mean to set something apart? So if you guys were ever somebody's favorite, what would happen when you're somebody's favorite is they'll be like, oh no, Jimmy likes that piece of pie, so we're going to go ahead and take this and we're going to put it over here so that nobody can get that because that's his. You've been set apart by God. Nobody can get you. You are his. You are his. You are his. He elevated you to a higher place because you are his. You are his. Amen? And it's all all we do. See, we make faith like it's hard. But all we do is we access it through faith, by believing. When you all came in here, everybody sat down. Did anybody inspect the chair? Did anybody like flip it over and make sure that the welds were properly done? Did you flip it over and make sure it was properly inspected? No, you just sat down and trusted that the chair would hold you. Faith is you just sitting, resting, being confident and trusting that God will hold you, that he will hold you, that all the weight and all the things and all the stuff, that he will hold you, and that you have been set apart for his purpose, out of his love. Because it's not of works. Verse 9 is real clear. It says, not of works, lest anyone should do what? Boast. Boast. See, we look at it like that means we just got to be humble and we can't talk about these things and we just got to be meek and mild and all that. No, we don't. You didn't save yourself. You didn't pull yourself out of the miry clay and you didn't set your feet on the rock to stay. You didn't put the song in your soul today, a song of praise. Hallelujah. If you don't know what I'm doing, read a hymnal sometime. It's a great song. But you didn't pull yourself out of the pit. He did. He marked you vital. He made you alive. He made you of worth. He made you of value. So I don't boast of me. I boast of him. Look what the Lord has done. Now we're going back to the 90s. Look what the Lord has done. 
I boast of him that he won the day. He hung the banners. There's banners of me and you hanging up in the rafters of heaven that where he can point that he won you. There's no second place banners. There's no silver and bronze medals. You are gold medals of God's grace, of his value. So we boast of him, amen? In verse 10, I said all that, now I'm preaching. Now here's the sermon. We got all there to verse 10. For we are what? We are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. Translations give way to, to two real meanings there. Half of them say workmanship, the other half say masterpiece. I like them both. Workmanship gives way to the words handiwork, craftsmanship, artistry. You are his artistry. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You've been handcrafted in your mother's womb, is what David said. You've been formed together in your mother's womb, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made by him, his artistry. We are a reflection of his artistry. We are a reflection of his tremendous work. Tremendous work. You are well crafted. Have you ever been into, have you ever went to somebody's house and you walk in, it's like, man, this is really nice. And everything was like top notch and was all great. But then you go to somebody's house and they're like, oh yeah, that guy wanted like, that guy wanted a bunch of money, but we did it ourselves. And you see gaps in the floor and you see where stuff's a little crooked. I say that because I grew up that way. Because it's not like, it was, it was just done, and it was okay, and it was good enough to live in, and everything's fine. But when you really see somebody of great skill work something out, it's all detailed. Every line is perfect. Every line is right. My dad took me to car shows my whole life, and you would see the ones where somebody would rattle can it, and they would paint the car, and it looked good from 50 feet away. But when you got up to it, it was it was like, whoa. But then you saw where a person had 100, 200 hours just in the paint. And you could walk over there and you could literally see your reflection through it. You are his reflection of his love, of his grace, of his forgiveness, of his ever-increasing power in your life. But you are also his masterpiece. You're his masterpiece. Do we like masterpieces? We love masterpieces. Why? Because a masterpiece is priceless. It's priceless. It's one of a kind. It's an original. You know, you don't look at a masterpiece and go, oh, it's all right. It's all right. It's like you look at it and you see details. And every time you look at something that's just so wonderfully done, you look at it and you can find more details that you didn't see the last time you saw it. That's what you are. There's more to you than what you think there is. There's more to you than what you, th what you think there is. There's more details to you that you haven't even discovered yet that God put there on the inside of you. He added great value to our lives. But the third, there's actually a third. The word, when they translated this over, in 1610, when they translated this over, the word that was actually used in the Greek is a word called poema, P-O-I-E-M-A. And it's what, and it means something made, is what it means. And it's where we get the word poetry from, or poem. I keep saying poem, and Hannah says I say it wrong. Thank you, Patty. But but it's where we get the word poetry or poem from. Poem. Do we like poems? You know, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. 
My dad had a friend. He did the funeral for a long time ago. He wrote, roses are reddish, violets are bluish. If it wasn't for Jesus, we'd all be Jewish. Good old Fred. And so that's the only poem. Every time I hear about a poem, that's the only poem I know. But you're a poem. You're a poetry. What, what is poetry? Poetry is the expression of the heart, of the feeling, of the intent of the poet. You are the expression of the heart, of the feeling, of the sentiment of the poet God. You are the expression of that. You are the song. You are his song. You are his lyric. You are his anthem in this world. Me and Tony about a month ago had a long conversation about the power of music and how music can transcend boundaries, can transcend cultures, can transcend languages. How people can be moved by music. I watched a video of a famous singer who'd been singing for 75 years and he's got full-blown aut- or not autism, Alzheimer's. And it's, he fully doesn't know who anybody is and anything he is. But the minute they play his music, he takes off and he sings it word for word. And it's just, it just comes out of him. And he sings it, and it's so beautiful to watch that. You are God's expression. You are God's lyric. You are God's lyric for the world to hear. For the world to hear. There's more to you than just, you're not just, you're not just one of many. You're the original. You're his masterpiece. You are good. See, the world, see, we put the, we put good, G-O-O-D, good. When I think of the word good, I think, eh, okay, satisfactory. It's like, this is good. Because, you know, language advances. So when language has advanced, what happens is we get more words. So, so now that word good just kind of becomes like, okay. But it says this, that when God was done creating the world, what did he call it in Genesis? Good. He looked at it and he called it good. Good means of highest quality, of utmost value. Think about it. God looked at the world and he called it good. I just want to encourage you today. You're good. You're good. You don't have to try to be good. See, Jesus didn't come and die just to make you, just to change your behavior from bad to good. He didn't come to change your behavior. You were dead. You were gone. And he made you alive. But when he made you alive, he made you of the highest quality. He made you of the utmost value. He made you priceless. He made you vital to him, to him, because that's what this says. I'm going to be, stay with me about 10 minutes, because I'm going to be real with you. My whole life, when I would get to this part right here, I like the workmanship part. We all like the workmanship part, but then we get to created in Christ for good works. And just being real for a minute, cold chills would go up my neck. And I would, like, freak out every time I'd read this. It wasn't because of how my parents raised me. It wasn't because of what I learned. It was just because when I saw that I was made for good works, then I felt like I had to always perform and do good works or I would lose my workmanship status or I would lose my masterpiece status. So I would stress myself out. I would stress everybody else out. And I would try my best to... At all times, make sure I do good things. Make sure I do good. Make sure I be good. Make sure I act good. You know what happened? I didn't really do those things. I tried and I tried and I tried. And I ended up, it felt like every time I tried, I just kept kept getting kicked back. Anybody ever been that way? You try and you try and you try. But when you really read this, you are his 
masterpiece. You are his workmanship. You are his poem. Created in Christ for good works. You weren't made just to go out and try every time you do to do a good work. No, good works just flow out of you. They just come out of you. They just happen. They just happen. About eight years ago, maybe nine years ago, me and Hannah, well, no, probably about ten years ago, me and Hannah just got married. And I was a real jerk. I mean, I was a jerk. I was selfish. I was... I was just, I was just thinking everything had to be because I was so, to be honest with you, I was so uptight about always trying to be good works that I became like a jerk about it to where I really wasn't fun to be around. So we're driving down the road and Hannah tells me one time, she looks at me and she goes, you're such a good man. And instantly I felt guilt and I felt shame. Because I didn't feel like I had done enough to be a good man. So I would say, no, 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 no. I'm not a good man. I'm not a good man. No, 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 no. I'd be like, Jerry Cape's a good man. Dan's a good man. I'm not a good man. My dad's a good man. I'm not that. And this went on till finally she says it one more time and I tell her I'm not. And she just looks at me and she goes, don't you ever say that again. And I'm like a dog who just got yelled at. I'm like, she's like, don't you ever say that again. I didn't marry a bad man. I married a good man. And every time I call you a good man, you have to agree with me. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So, you, you know, I was like, you're right, you're right. I'm sorry. Da, da, da. The very next day, you know what she does? You're a good man. And I just looked at her. I'm like, oh. and she goes, say it, say it. And so I felt really dumb and really weird. I'd be like, I'm a good man. I'm a good man. I'm a good man. This went on for three, four months. And she'd do it, and, I, and she'd make me say it. She said to me one time on the phone and made me say it until I couldn't get off the phone until I said I was a good man. It's like eating your vegetables. And so I would just go, I'm a good man. I'm a good man. So finally... I started saying, I'm a good man. I'm a good man. So finally she'd be like, you're a good man. And I go, dang straight. You know it. You got that right. I am a good man. Because I just knew it. I just felt it. So then fast forward probably six months later. I, uh, the ministry I worked for, we did a conference in Arkansas. And uh, Hannah and I have a really close friend in our lives who we love and care about and she was going through a really hard time and so without thinking about it it wasn't a monumental thing I didn't hear the voice of God I didn't do anything I just thought you know I'm just going to get them a hotel room I'm going to get them where they can come down they can take part and I'll just get them nice seats and they'll just have fun and Hannah can come and hang out and they'll just have fun I was really just thinking I'm just doing Hannah would like this, so I'll just do this for Hannah, and this is, it'll, it, and it'll be fun. So we did, and it was a beautiful place, and they come, and normally I would be really uptight about this stuff. But I just felt like everything's good, just let them do their thing. And uh, that night an altar call got done, and that girl stood up and she accepted Christ into her life. And it was powerful. She was shaking, everybody's crying, and it was a, and her life has never been the same since. And I watched that, and I cried. I'm like, thank you, God. And the next day, God speaks to me. You, God may speak to you in certain places. God speaks to me in the shower. So I'm taking the shower, and I'm just like, God, thank you so much for what you did, and thank you for what you did for her, and thank you for changing her life. And I'm just praying. I'm so happy. And I hear, this is where I hear the voice of God. I hear God say, I did it because I had a good man. Because I had a good man. I did it because there was a good man. There was boots on the ground. And I was, a, I was able to do it because I had a good man. 
Romans 2, 4 says the goodness of God is what leads us to repentance. And we are all carriers of his goodness that helps lead people to a place of change. You are all, everyone in here, you're a good mom, you're a good dad, you're a good grandparent, you're a good kid, you're a good employee, you're a good business owner. Because the only way that good works flow out of you is no, you knowing you are a good work. You are a good work. You're not a bad work. You're not a bad work. You're a good work. And, and this is, you know, but, but I honestly believe this. If Hannah wouldn't have, like, rode me about that and just made it because death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it eat the fruit thereof and she saw she saw goodness in me before I saw goodness in me she was a good work who identified a good work so my charge to us today is let's be good works who just identify good work Let's not try to change people. Let's not keep scorecards. Let's not write out big things that we think people need to change about themselves. Or, and let's not criticize if somebody didn't say it quite right or something didn't happen quite right. Let's not do that. Let's just say, good job. Good job. Good job. I'm going to be real with you. I do very well when people tell me that I look good. I really do. I feel good. It makes you feel good. It releases endorphins into your brain, and it builds confidence in you. Let's not go around and try to prove to everybody that we may know more than the other. No. Let's tell people they're good people. Let's, let's see the masterpiece and the treasure inside of people before they see it. Before they see it. Let's live our lives that way because masterpieces should be able to identify a masterpiece. You are qualified to identify another masterpiece. You are, you are well qualified to identify that in life because you are his reflection. You are his priceless possession. You are his expression of his love and his grace and his mercy in life. One more thing and then I'm done. Put me on the scoreboard, Ken. Anybody ever watch Lion King? So you watch Lion King, you know, PJ's like, I don't watch Lion King. Oh yeah, you're a grandpa, you've seen them all. So you watch Lion King and you know, Simba was the son of the king and Simba, his dad dies a horrific death. And Simba is led by a lie that he killed his father. And he is led by a lie that he is nothing but trash. And he's of no worth. And he has to go to the wasteland to live now. And that's what he felt. That's what he felt. So he goes to the wasteland. And he meets up with a weird pig and a weirder meerkat or something. And they sing a cool song. We all know the song. But he's out there for years in this wasteland because he believed a lie. Because he believed in a false identity. Because he believed that everybody hated him. Because he believed that he did something so horrific that it would, that his father was even disappointed in him. So the story goes, somebody comes back into Simba's life and reminds him, you are the true king. You are the true person. You're the rightful person for this. So he's got all this stuff going on in his head. And he goes to like this little pond and he looks in the water. And there's a weird monkey involved too. But he looks in the water and when he looks in the water, he doesn't see his reflection. He sees the reflection of his father. And when he saw the reflection of his father, it gave him worth. It gave him value because he saw 
whose he is. And when he knew whose he was, then he knew who he was. Come on now. So today, I just want to tell you, you are the reflection of your Father, God. You may feel like you have done wrong, and you may be, you may be in verse 2 and 3 right now with the sons of disobedience, and you may be that. But you can come to the water, and when you look in, you see your Father. You see your Father. There... I can go anywhere in this area and people know I am his son because I look like him. I'm made made in his reflection because I look like him. You are made in the image of God. Don't let anybody try, don't let anything or anybody try to make you feel like you're a generic piece or you're damaged goods or you're not worth and you should just be off in the wasteland. You are of value to God because you are in his reflection. Stand to your feet. Let's just, let's just lift up our hands in, in here and let's just honor him. Father, we just honor you. Father, we just praise you. Father, we thank you. That, Lord, that we are yours, that we belong to you. King David said, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. You are his beloved. So, Father, I thank you. We come against false identities, and we come against false pretexts, and we come against lies that people have told to them about themselves for years. And we just say, but God. We cancel that out. And we say, but God who is rich in mercy, love, and forgiveness. So if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus into your life, it's not a hard process. It's not a difficult thing. It's it's a simple receiving. Just receiving what he has for you. Today can be your day. So I'm just going to ask everybody today, just by the sound of my voice, just repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior. and Be my Lord. I repent of my old ways. And I turn to you. And I accept the life that you have for me. I believe that you exist. I believe that you're in my heart. I thank you that I will go to heaven and I will enjoy the journey. Amen. Father, I just pray blessings upon each and every person in here. Father, I just thank you that as we go through this week, that, Lord, that you'll just, we thank you that your goodness, that your presence, that your grace will just become so evident in all of our lives. And, Lord, we just thank you. We praise you, Father, for what you have done in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen.